Bonjour, buenos dias to everyone. A hearty welcome and greeting. My name is Alistair Glean. I am the acting representative for the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation and Agriculture's delegation in Barbados. And I would like to formally welcome you to this fifth session of the ECA CoLCP Caribbean Agri-Food Business Series. Uh, today's session, the first installment for our 2022 program, is titled Opportunities for SMEs and Businesses in Export Markets. I'm really excited to discuss this topic. It's overall, we're going to be looking at agricultural trade. And I think this is something that came out of the calls of the various participants in our series last year. And generally, for us in the Caribbean region, it is a priority. So let me again welcome my colleagues from CoLACP, in particular Isolina Boto and her team, my ECA colleagues. Uh, we have some here today, my moderator in the office in Barbados, Dr. Roxanne Waite, and all the other ECA colleagues from across the region and the hemisphere. Of course, we want to welcome our development partners, the various agencies, our dynamic group of presenters here today, and we'll introduce them shortly, and to you, the participants. This activity can be of no substance without the participation of the various businesses, agencies, interested persons from across Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific. I got really excited when I saw messages popping up on the screen from countries in Africa, Uganda, uh, et cetera, from France, Germany, from the Pacific, and of course, the Caribbean. So this is a really dynamic opportunity for us here today. I expect today's session to be a really fun-filled yet exciting capacity building session where we can appreciate some of the issues related to agricultural trade. Uh, as I indicated before, for us in the region, there's an in intense focus on enhancing intra-regional trade and also exploring access to overseas markets, in particular markets in Europe. And that is something that we've been talking about last year when we had our series it was always a priority for us, and we felt that we should start off this year looking at uh, the export markets, particularly in the EU. However, before we started the planning for this session, we felt that we should engage you, the various participants, to hear from you what you felt about the sessions that were held last year. And we undertook a survey exercise. We engaged close to 2,000 participants from the series, uh, we got a response rate of close to 20%, almost 200, 200 companies participated, responded rather. And we had a general guide as to how we should move forward. And overwhelmingly, everyone was pleased with the session. And of course, they provided insights into how we should proceed for 2022. Uh, I want to pause a bit and ask my colleague, Axel Rupert, if she wants to add anything about the survey that was undertaken. Axel, anything you'd like to share? I think that fine, you presented the most uh, results and outcome, thank you. Okay, so we were general, there was general excitement and interest in the series. And of course, moving forward, what we've decided to do is we're gonna have this series on a quarterly basis. So we don't have meeting fatigue, persons having to be on regularly. We wanna make sure our sessions are really packed with information that's, that's pertinent to your business activity. And as I said before, we want this to be a capacity building session that you leave here with information and allow you to improve your business or allow you to support businesses in the region better. More than that, our focus is on micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. These micro, small and medium-sized enterprises hold a lot of potential for developing economies, particularly in the Caribbean. They employ a number of persons, they uh, provide for an exchange, et cetera. And we feel that we should continue with this focus on the micro, small, and medium-sized community. I would also say from the ECA end, our, our focus is also related to supporting these micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises for our international trade and regional integration program in the region. That is the, our center of focus. I can tell you also for our climate change programs, our agriculture and food safety programs, there are a number of initiatives that we're undertaking that are aimed at promoting the access to markets by our small and medium-sized enterprises. In particular, we are right now implementing an EU-funded SPS-related program. 
that seeks to allow our micro, small and medium-sized enterprises to access European markets. I don't want to spend too much more time. I want to get straight into this session. But I also want to add before I close off that we are currently, as ECA, uh, facilitating a virtual round table that brings together buyers and sellers from across the hemisphere. And this is something that we want to do specific for the Caribbean sometime in October. And we will have another round table, another virtual trade show for the hemisphere sometime in August. So let me pause there and again welcome you to today's dynamic session. We have a lot of presenters on today, so I don't want to spend too much more time talking. Let me move straight into the session today. It will be broken up into two parts. The first part entails uh, experiences from our agri-food businesses, and I'll allow the moderator to introduce those businesses shortly. And the second part of the session, we go into a more technical insights from importers and exporters and persons engaged in financing and general research and analysis of the markets in the EU. So I'm looking forward to today's session. So with that said, let me pass on to my moderator, who's also my colleague in the office in Barbados. Uh, allow me to introduce Dr. Roxanne Witt, a dynamic, dynamic professional. Roxanne is a technical specialist for the eco office here in Barbados. She provides significant expertise in the field of training and certification for persons at all levels involved in the agri-food sector. Roxanne leads our Youth Farm Program, which is a program held in Barbados that allows young persons, particularly at the secondary school level, to obtain expertise and vocational training in agriculture, livestock, uh, aquaculture, uh, crop production, etc. Dynamic program, and if you're interested, we can provide more information on that subsequently. She has proven experience in developing and managing national and regional projects, and she also works with in the area of agritourism and climate change. Uh, she has a PhD in education from the University of the West Indies with a focus on technical and vocational education. And her master's is also in the area of agribusiness. With that said, let me welcome Dr. Waite and invite you all to sit back and enjoy today's session. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Alistair. Now I'll get right into today's session. For the first part, we will hear from representatives of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises who will share stories of resilience, challenge, and change. The idea is to tap into the lessons learned from these panelists as they reflect on how they have had to adapt their businesses to changing trade realities, become more resilient, and engage more effectively in global value chains. Our first speaker is Mr. Roy Neural. He's the managing director of Tijul Company Limited, an agro-processing manufacturer located in Palmer's Cross, Clarendon, Jamaica. Tijul is a family-owned business founded in 1982. The company began exporting in 1984, and presently 95% of its output of sauces, condiments, and baked bami, which is a traditional Jamaican cassava flatbread. For those of you who don't know it, it is awesome. And this flatbread, amongst other products, is sold to international markets. I would like to invite Mr. Roy Newell to come to the fore and share his story with you, Mr. Newell. Thank you, my great moderator. Um, morning, everyone. Um, it's been a pleasure to hear and share, to be here to share our experiences. And um, I think it is quite important that we continue communicating in order to break down some of the challenges and share the opportunities that may exist in trade. Um, a lot of time, a lot of energies and resources lies with us, among us, and we fail to, to, to connect, hence we lose lots of opportunities that, that um, is available among ourselves. Anyways, um, let me just get directly in telling you more about Taiju Company. Um, as our mother has initiated. Um, you know, it's a family owned business that has been started by Dr. Juliet Newell, who was a food scientist. Yeah, she had passed about 11 years ago. Um, I've, I was introduced to the company a long time ago, not loving this kind of business, but 
had an interest in business overall. And I was brought up in agribusiness, more livestock, so, more so than plants. Um, I took an interest and took on the challenge about 25 years ago, not directly, but indirectly, staying around the business, learning the opportunities, the ins and outs, yeah, of the operation, and hence, when my aunt passed, I was the only one that was able to carry on the business. Um, this company has two brands, two, both two brands, Nels and Juliana brands at the time. Um, it was intended to be an export mainly company because of the challenges that were faced in third world countries with foreign exchange, instabilities of economies, et cetera, et cetera. So it was targeting export markets, mainly in the first world, United States, England, and Canada. Um, we had to diversify a great deal in making, not branding per se, but co-packing for other companies in order to get into the markets quicker and in order to get the foreign exchange that was so urgent and important to operations um, viability. We co-packed for big brands in England, USA, Canada, yeah? And it took the company to a high heights, uh, for at least the first five, six years, we were able to pay our bills, pay our workers, and build community projects out of it. Um, we have moved up to about year 2007 when export challenges became more and more demanding in terms of requirements from our international customers and countries. So we had to move to start getting HASA accreditation as per the requirements in order to keep some of our, our skews into the first world market. We had a dedicated workforce that we could not feel and our responsibility was to make sure that the quality of life that they would have been exposed to, yeah? yeah we did not, we did not fall, we must improve these communities. And for my aunt who was diehardly um, uh, um, dedicated to the upliftment of women, Dr. Juliet Newell, yeah? Made a special effort and special sacrifice, yeah? In order to go and build this brand in this community and build the people, yeah? That um, surround us. Um, we have a wide array. We have built out a wide array of sauces, um, seasoning, condiments, jams, jellies, canned products, Aki, Kalo, Bami, etc. Yeah. And every product, all those, so 95 products, a percent of what we do, or 98% of what we do is exported, are uh, exportable. Yeah. We have a few companies in the uh, in USA. We have a widespread international with USA, Japan, Guam, Bahamas, Canada, Grenada. Yeah. And we appeal to the diaspora internationally, basically. Um, our supply chain partners are male, female farmers, yeah, in rural, seven rural communities, sometimes more, yeah, depending on demand and availability. But we try to also create associations with our farmers, yeah, in order to organize and plan supplies so we can reduce the cost of storage of raw materials. We have to try to mitigate against natural disasters in our planning, try to get things to be planted and harvested before the hurricane season sometimes that really damages our projections, et cetera, et cetera, and our, our, our delivery times. Um, we basically have added over the last two and a half years, just prior to COVID getting the widespread and recognition that it has had, yeah? We have had to introduce new brands in order to capitalize on our local market, just in case that, um, there would be any stoppages or bottlenecks in our, in our international trade. The relevance for international our local market became very important. Yeah, as a company that was dependent almost entirely on exports for its for its uh, viability and sustainability. So we had to build out kind of blends, a new juice which we which we've added to life. There are natural juices. Most of the products that we do normally falls within a, a product line that is of a healthy nature, a safe environment. Yeah, that, uh, in which we manufacture. Those are some of the highlights that we place focus on in building our new things and new brands. The new brands, the local dependency on, on, on our product lines now has become 
even more so important for us now because we have realized that, that with international disorders that may occur, the company can or may close overnight. Yeah. So the priority become to, to, to make sure we have a local um 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 what do you call that now um um access and recognition to markets has become our main drive for this year and for the last two years. Yeah. We have our certified food safety systems also that qualifies us for mainly the US market, but internationally standards are recognized and accepted over the world. We were one of the first com uh, companies in Jamaica to have achieved this standard, and we have always been a trendsetter in this field. Our strengths lead is with pioneering certain um, um, food safety trends and rules and requirements of international market. We have it, it cast a lot for a, a, a third world country and for a small company, but we have managed to put that as one of our first priorities. It is a key component of, of maintaining and sustaining our, our international market. We also have certain strengths in, 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 our, in how we manage our farm family, supply chain farm families. Yeah, with that, we try to pay cash for everything that we receive from them in order to keep them um, liquid so they can maintain their supplies and um, reduce the dependency on loans. And it's a form of anchorage um, partnership in which we would try to seek to get the loans, but we try to offer cash while we manage how it is spent with our farmers also. Yeah, it is a bit informal because we know the farmers to a certain degree. So there's less requirements for, for a lot of documentation, etc., for them to access these loans. Yeah. We, and we also give grants to community uh, um, um, family members and, and of workers yeah, when there is any form of extremes in terms of challenges in school fees, sometimes with kids, death in the family, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So Tajul has been playing a very active role in community development, parish development and country development. We have basically since COVID, even though there were, it was serious extremes and we had challenges and still have challenges in packaging materials, et cetera, et cetera. We have still managed to grow the company at least 30% in the last two years. Yeah? So we have a, a target of taking, making this a billion dollar company. Yeah? And um, in the short term, yeah, if all goes well, if the wars and diseases doesn't overwhelm us. Yeah, so basically that summarizes our 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 our, our um, intentions, yeah, and our and our presence in the um in our environment in which we operate and our efforts to grow and build, yeah, the, the agricultural um, um and agro processing inputs in Jamaica and exports that will make us a better place. We also believe that agriculture is the only only platform on which if we build and put enough energy yeah and enough investment in that product it will affect everybody in every nook and cranny of Jamaica. I think it's one of the easiest platform on which you can go and build an effect yeah positively affect um, people across the country. Hence why we keep steadfastly yeah making our inputs encouraging people counseling people yeah teaching people what they know and access information for people that do not have it. Yeah. So they can better farm, better support, and better make independence possible for themselves and ourselves as a country. Um, we have issues in terms of getting large money sometimes for the basic it's one of the dreams that we have because we need to scale up a lot of operations. Um, the risk, the risk factors of not doing that is, is, is can be catastrophic in the short term. But um, we plan to, we're not displacing anybody by, by retooling what we want to um, realign and reorganize operations that those things that are not able to be mechanized, because a lot of operations are very difficult to be mechanized. But we need to mechanize certain aspects in order to cut costs, be competitive, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. But we'll just relocate people as to where we need most of their efforts. Um, we partner with international companies in terms of 
of, of making things available in terms of packaging material now. Yeah. So the, the dependency of getting money to send back to cheap, sometimes it happens in their countries at the same time. Yeah, without sending to Jamaica and the back and forth. So it cuts through the chases and make a lot of things easier for us. Um, we spend a lot of money to protect our local brands by having them properly registered, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So these are some key um, components that we can discuss further down the discussion, but that summarizes our intentions, our involvement, and our partners' involvement in what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much there, Mr. Newell, for that very deep insight in such a short space of time into um, to know what uh, resonates with me is the fact that you're working with authentic Jamaican products backed by internationally recognized food safety certification. Um, I know there are gonna be a lot of questions for Mr. Newell, what we're asking all our participants to do is to please put your questions in the chat and we will address them towards the end of our program. I want to get right into the next panelist presentation and introduce Ms. Daphne de Gregory Biauli. She is the Managing Director of Abaco Neem Bahamas. She's a Bahamian citizen born in Kingston, Jamaica. Daphne worked in Paris, Venice, and in the Bahamas, and she's actually a trained cosmetologist, as well as a licensed yoga instructor and a real estate agent. Daphne currently leads Abaco Neem Limited with her husband, Nick. And Abaco Neem is the only certified organic farm in the Bahamas, which produces over 23 different neem health and beauty products. I'd like to introduce Daphne and let her tell you a little bit more about Abaco Neem. Daphne? Daphne, are you there? Can, I, can everyone hear me all right and, and uh, see me okay? We can. Okay, great. Um, thank you, first of all, for this opportunity. Uh, to be able to share the challenges and the successes of uh, our farm experience. Abaco Neem started 30 years ago and um, being an agricultural business, I have to say that it has many challenges, most of all uh, and importantly is nature. We cannot fight Mother Nature. And I want to thank Mr. Newell for the technical um, input that he gave in his presentation. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the practical side. We've suffered many hurricanes, um, and most recently the, the devastating Dorian hurricane. So one of the first things in uh, an agricultural-based business I would emphasize is the fact that First of all, can you afford to lose your crop? And what protection are you, or what uh, are you providing in terms of being able to carry? In, in our case, we need to have uh, neem oil available for the next three years um, in the event that we do have you know, a loss of crop. So th that's one of the things that I would like you to focus on. Um, can you change the slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So we, we produce, uh, as was indicated, 23 different products. Uh, as a result of Dorian, COVID, and the economic times of today, we have now started to downsize the number of products and the number of sizes that we make available to our customers. The supply chain has become a big challenge with getting the right containers, uh, adequate um, you know, supply in raw materials. So we've actually had to adjust and look at and analyze what are the best selling sizes. So instead of selling from a one to a 16 ounce, you know, one, two, four, eight, 16 ounces uh, options, 
we've chosen two sizes, three ounce, which is travel compatible, which is important in this tourism industry to have a, the largest possible size that can be taken in a handbag. And then the most popular larger size, the eight ounce. So instead of having the inventory of all those containers, we now have reduced or we're moving towards reducing those variety of sizes. Um, another thing is you have to remember that everyone will want you, if you're in this kind of market, everyone will want you to produce the product they want. Why don't you have a deodorant? Why don't you have a um, more variety of soap? Why, you know, why don't you have um, a shaving lotion? You cannot be satisfying the customers always. But what we have done is sought out other industry partners who perhaps provide a deodorant and gone into uh, engage them in producing a neem deodorant for us. So we're now passing in uh, business on to other companies. Post Dorian, we uh, partnered with um, a company that was producing an antiseptic, just a general basic antiseptic for hands, um, sanitizer. So we approached them and came up with uh, a better formula. Um, a higher value formula by infusing neem into the hand sanitizer to make it um, more attractive and to provide that support for both our companies to grow. So change the slide, please. Um, export, our biggest challenge is cost, obviously. Getting anything out of the Bahamas is expensive. We um, used, originally we used FedEx, DHL, I know UPS is available. You've got sea and air carriers, other countries in the Caribbean have, um, I believe better options in, in that area than we do. Um, and engaging with these carriers and negotiating the best possible price for exports at the moment, we have to use only DHL because FedEx stopped selling anything uh, that contained liquid. If we didn't have the relationship with those two agencies, we would have been sort of shut out and had to scramble to um, organize a second export avenue. Fortunately, we were using DHL, who continues to today to ship all products. And when I say liquids, lotions, creams, they consider them all liquids. Um, our post office, because of COVID, they stopped shipping anything out as well. So DHL has been our only export opportunity. And we had to fight very hard to negotiate an affordable rate. Uh, you kind of have to guarantee a certain number of shipments. And so you've got to have already established an export business to establish a better rate or to negotiate a better rate. However, once you've signed up with them, as your exports increase, you can always go back and try to negotiate even better pricing. Uh, you also have to make sure that your carriers are reliable um, you have to know who's going to be responsible if something is damaged. Uh, you have to be prepared to eat the loss. And in a lot of cases, uh, things have gone missing, packages have been damaged, customs, they're all, all our export packages are subject to the country's customs. Sometimes they can be held up. Customers can become upset because what should have taken a week could maybe be held up for two weeks. And so you've got to also have that customer interaction and keep your customers posted as to any delays or issues that may be arising from the export entry. Um, you've got to, okay, can we change the next slide, please? Okay, so 
we've talked about uh, cost of transport, price comparisons in your market. No, you have to do a, a certain amount of research into the country that you intend to export your product to. What are, who is your competition? What are their prices? You've got to do that in detail. And you've got to also research who your partners are going to be in those areas. Uh, what, in our case, we generally would approach pharmacies or uh, food stores. Um, and we have our products, we have found that our products sell most of all in the food stores because everybody has to go there and they have a health and beauty section. Um, we also create our own display units so that our product line is sold in a recognizable uh, display, easily recognizable display, and not just put on the shelf along with like other products. We've tried both ways and found that by putting all the products together in one display helps to sell the overall line. Instead of somebody just going in and looking for a neem shampoo, they may see the shampoo and think, oh, I've, they've got a toothpaste. I'll try the tooth powder or the toothpaste. Uh, so it, one, it, it does help to sell the whole line through. Uh, labeling. Labeling is very, very important and can be an expensive mistake if you don't get it right the first go. UPC, you have to have your UPC codes. Um, you've got to make sure that the country that you're exporting to, if they have um, requirements for labeling, is it bilingual? Uh, do you have the proper tariff codes also for importing those um, items? A lot of research has to go into your, your, has to be done before you start to ship. You also have to have very close relations with your local distributors or your local stores. Who is going to be your go-to person? Build a relationship with them. Make sure that they're using your product. There's nothing like the testimonial of a salesperson saying that how they've used the product, how it's been good for them. If they don't know it and they haven't used it, they're not going to recommend it and they're not going to be convincing to your customer. Also, um, how are you going to get paid? That's very important. You've got to make sure that you've got reliable payment um, structure and also take into consideration what exchange rates are in your pricing, you've got to make sure that you um, you have priced and allowed some exchange fluctuation there. If you're going to Europe, for instance, uh, the slightest change in, in rates, if you give anybody credit, for instance, when, when it goes into the market, it might be costing, you might be getting X number of dollars in return, but if there's an exchange rate and you haven't allowed for it in your negotiations, you could be losing. And in the agricultural market, we know we're all working, working on very slim margins, so can't afford to lose a penny. Um, also insurance costs, who's gonna be responsible once the goods arrive at the um, des destination? If there's issues, who's going to be responsible for that? Those have, they have to have clear lines in that as well between you and the importer. Um, and who's going to be responsible for clearing the goods and the brokerage expenses? Is that an expense that the importer is gonna um, honor or are you going to be responsible? Um, the main benefit to us in our business, our experience was being able to access foreign markets. And we started off very slowly, very, very slowly. And we started off, first of all, with customers that used our product in our country or discovered our product in our country. So our second homeowners and our visitors who liked the product, they wanted to know, well, if we want to get more, how do we get it? So an, a very important thing to 
establishes a mailing list. Every single customer who comes through your door, if you can capture their mailing list um, information, then you can continue to market to them. Can you change the slide, please? Okay. So the, uh, the world is your market. The world is your market, but you have to, um, as I say, put a lot of research in. You have to have your international uh, media avenues. Um, social media is very important. And have somebody young, because most of us in agriculture are older. You've got to engage somebody young who can be on the ball. Today it's Twitter, tomorrow it's TikTok. Then Facebook is like, that's what we grew up with, the Facebook, that's sort of becoming obsolete now. So you've got to have somebody young and quick and who can engage the social media market. Next slide, please. The key to success is service and reliability. The most important thing is that your product should do what you say it does. It should also have be consistent. Your production levels should always be tested and monitored and uh, always have, you know, a consistent taste, feel, touch. Um, you've got to be able to eat your losses if there are damages or returns. A bad customer will undo any good marketing that you've invested in. So you've got to be able to absorb some of those expenses and following up is very important with your customer service when a customer receives in a product overseas especially maybe build up build in a follow-up email communication maybe a week later are you enjoying the product or introducing a new product a reminder after a month maybe have you run out of product, do you want to reorder, you know, touching them. You've got to touch your customer, okay? I, am I getting an indication, Roxanne, that it's time to wrap up? Okay, sorry. There's so much to say about the challenges and the successes, but most important, my husband says you've got to have stickability. You've got to be able to roll with the punches, ride the waves, and pick up your shoe bootstraps when disaster hits and start over. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. I know with your wealth of experience that you have so much to share and we've given you such a short time to do it. But I tell you what, those nuggets, I am sure, have been really well received and they're invaluable to our listeners. I love how you started with the cautionary tale on the importance of being prepared for national disasters such as hurricanes. And I also like the fact that you keep reminding us that we need to stay connected to our customers. And we also need to, to jump on any opportunities that we find to create strategic partnerships with other businesses to enhance and grow what we already have. Like I said, you I know you have so much more to share, but we do need to make time for our next presenter. Thank you again. Daphne. And without further ado, I would like to introduce the final panelists for this part one of this series, or today's session rather, Mr. Roderick St. Clair. Mr. Roderick St. Clair is the Managing Director of Grenada Cooperative Nutmeg Association. He's an agribusiness specialist who focuses on marketing and value chain development, and he's worked for over two decades in the agriculture business sector in Grenada, mainly in fresh produce marketing as a senior manager at the Marketing and National Importing Board. In 2019, he entered the spice subsector as the general manager of the Grenada Cooperative Nutmeg Association. In October of 2020, Roderick received his instruments to represent the interests of farmers and fishers as their senator in the upper house of the Grenada Parliament. Mr. St. Clair, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, 
Chris White, and also I want to thank the ICA and the Cool ACP team for having invited the Grenada Cooperative Not Mega Association and through myself to share our experiences. I want to also say greetings to all the participants who are here listening in on this important session. Grenada Cooperative Not Mega Association. Um, interestingly, only on Sunday, the 27th of March, would have celebrated its 75th anniversary of the existence. And this corporation is a corporation of nutmeg farmers who are producers throughout Grenada, the country, the Spice Isle, as we call it. And of course, it was established by an act of parliament. So nutmeg being such an important product then was, I wouldn't say protected, but the interests of that industry was secured through an act of parliament. In fact, if you Google, which I didn't show here, the nutmeg is also part of the symbol of our flag. So it shows then that whole significance of the nutmeg to our industry, to the economy uh, and so on, okay? So this is critical. And as a result of that, the act gives the association the authority to go through the, the purchasing, the processing, the sale of the nutmeg, such that you can maintain the sort of quality and standards and management of such a, what I would call a critical resource. Uh, currently, we have just over 3,000 farmers that are active members. Um, I must add quickly before the hurricane, that uh, Ivan 2004, we had in excess of 7,000 farmers. So this has shown, as our previous speaker alluded, significant challenges of our um, industries and the susceptibility to this insurance. Now, my second slide, I want to share with you the products. So what, what are the products that we are involved in? We are involved in um, before I, I, I go to the products, I must say that in terms of the, the age of the farmers and so on, this is very important. And that was also mentioned. Most of our farmers are elderly farmers. Um, our workforce is significantly manual and natural. Of course, we do have a young team of, of, of workers who are coming in to keep the, that whole legacy going. So this is very important. Um, we have different products. We have what we refer to as the black seed or shines, okay, that is the nutmeg. We also have the mist, which is that outer coating on, on the nutmeg. And if you look at our logo at the top, GCNA Grenada nutmeg, you would see what the nutmeg looks like, the yellow pod, and that red covering is the mist over the nutmeg, which is the that black um, seed. And inside of, of that shell at the kernel, you would have the nutmegs, as you see at the bottom, where it said songs and assorted. And this is one of our major export product. We also do them in different sizes. So you may get them as we refer to them as 110s or 80s, depend on, on the type of market. And on the other side, you would see the nutmegs in the jute bags being exported through containers through different parts of the world. And so our nutmeg right now is mainly a bulk commodity. Um, you would hardly find from Grenada, it's been sold in, in smaller consumer package. I will speak more about that as we go. So next slide, please, thank you. Okay, what we have attempted to do through, through the last um, couple of years is how do we add more value and transform the industry such that you don't, remove totally your bulk presence, but how do you add value from the whole um, product? And so we are seeing that we can have several products that we have been able to develop um, in the past um, years. However, we are not at the level of um, our good friend um, in the, the our first presenter tonight, sorry, today, but we will get there. Um, what we are trying to do, what we have done so far, is to take, for example, the pods 
And you can see the arrow showing the sort of products that we have developed from the pods, hot sauces, sweet and spicy sauce, nutmeg cooler, green seasoning and pickle. And I know you can read the slides yourself. And so the arrow is sort of showing the part of the nutmeg and what we are able to do with it. And of course, the traditional nutmeg, we are doing a dry seasoning. We're also doing some nutmeg spicy, different flavors with bourbonde, with um, sour sop and so on, but we have the nutmeg as a key ingredient. And of course, we are also using the shell, which normally um, used in your yard, you know, like in the Caribbean, you use it in a yard to in case there is mud and so on. And we are using it now, mainly, we have three different options. We are looking at the colored shell, so we can use it as a decor. We also have it where we can mix it with, with cement and have it as a as what we call nut crit. So you can do, like for example, flower pots and other sort of aggregates. Um, and this is, is developmental stage. And we also have a potting mix, which we have worked with Cardi to put also on the market. So you can use it to do your seedlings and so on. As you can see at the bottom, the nut mass. Um, at the other side, you also see some of the, the products that we have put onto the market locally. And of course, we have done small quantities of export to our diaspora, mainly within the, the New York, Miami market. Next slide, please, thank you. Okay, in terms of the bulk, I will say mainly this image here is to show you where we reach with our nutmeg in the bulk. So we see Canada, United Kingdom, Europe, um, Israel, India, um, Italy also is, is, should be on the list. Um, well, within Europe, you have different countries there, um, Netherlands, etc. cetera. Um, of course, we do ship to the Caribbean, to Caribbean, mainly Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados. We do some business in Dominica also, and Antigua, and of course, Argentina. Okay, if we go to the next slide and I will speak. So, so this year we sort of put all of this in context. So success, sometimes you think deep and you can create a whole long list, but two of our major success we'd say is the quality of our product. Being around for significant years has been able to give us that reputation as you will see Grenada Nutmeg is well known internationally for its quality, it's, it's authentic flavors. Um, that, that is a significant, we also have a defined process, a proven process that we have used for several years and decades, I must say, that we can able to guarantee that finished product um, to our consuming public as the bulk part of it. I would say the success, which is not there, is the whole idea of being able to look at that value addition and transforming the industry so that it can bring more value to our farmers. Another significant success is penetrating new markets. Um, getting into markets, as all of us know, has its own different intricacies, the shipping, logistics, um, cost is an issue because remember, Grenada is not the only not the producer in the world, despite you may have a good quality, um, some persons might be going for, for price. Um, the issue of the regulations and so on, overcoming them and, and being able to, to cope with them is, is also an important factor. Um, the success, I would say that is not listed here, is being able to harness the, the knowledge of, of both the farmers and the workers in maintaining this system into, into the future. Of course, we have obstacles and it's always good to have a long list of obstacles because sometimes you lose sight of the real problems by trying to say, well, I have not much problems. The whole issue of food safety in the issues of aflatoxin, ocratoxin, those are big issues for us. And of course, those of us who ship to Europe and do the, the fresh, uh, the raw products would understand um, not only those being challenges, but periodically you would find within the European Union in particular, they are constantly adjusting and making those measures are tighter and so on. And that is a major issue. And of course, at the local level, um, particularly in Grenada and even the OECS, our capacity to monitor and do a lot of these testings are very limited. So most time, again, we have to send 
our products away to be monitoring and in testing so that we can keep on track. Pesticide residues um, is also another challenge because you know in our integrated farming system, farmers will be using different products. You're not too sure what they're using. So the issue of constant education is, is very key so that to guarantee. Again, it comes back to the issue of abilities to do the proper testing. Shipping logistics, I also mentioned that before, but even now around Christmas time and even within this whole COVID environment, that is a challenge. And so what we may also find with the logistics of shipping is even the cost. And most of our nutmeg is sold on pre-contracts. So you have to be very careful in how you manage those things. And of course, I know you can read the rest of the stuff, the pandemic, the wars, finances, et cetera, are challenges. Um, technical barriers to trade, for example, right now we have the issues of trying to establish a standard, a world standard for, for nutmeg. And of course, we have different qualities within the Caribbean and Grenada buses in India and, and so on. And that is something that we have to overcome as we go forward. Next slide, please. Thank you. Next slide. Okay. In terms of opportunities, we see opportunities is getting our HACCP compliance. We are, we are well on stream with this. We have also been getting some assistance um, regionally um, from the OECS. And of course, within our own capacity and we are progressing well towards this because it gives us more confidence, give our buyers more confidence, give the downstream and users of our products in the industries more confidence. The value added and the circular economy um, also is an opportunity of added value. The plant sex determination, nutmeg can grow and it can either be male or female, and it takes some time, seven, eight years to discover whether it's a male or a female. So we are partnering with the local university, St. George's University, right now to do some early research so that we can determine that at the early stage. We have opportunities to increase production so that we can get back to close enough levels as before the hurricane Ivan. Carbon mapping, this is a very important area that can also add value as we look at the more greening of the product and adding better value. Geographic indication, we are well on streaming this. As you know, that is a major uh, market opportunity within the European Union for this type of differentiation in our products. Next slide, please, thank you. I think I right. So okay, good. So so this in a nutshell really presents, give you a snapshot of, of, of the challenges and so on. I know you can read up um, about Grenada Nutmeg, it's well known all over the world. And of course, they join the question and answer session. I'll be very happy to share more with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roderick. Um, and like the speaker before him. Roderick uh, stressed rather on the need to engage youth in agriculture for succession planning. Roderick, I also note that you spoke specifically about adding value, consistently referred to adding value to the product and the need to meet international food safety standards. Now, in terms of the product itself, I am really gung-ho on the idea of the nutmeg seasoning and the sweet and spicy sauce. I was looking to see if you had a hot and spicy sauce as well. I didn't see any, so put that we in. We do, we do. Okay, see, but there you go. So you have you had me at hot, very well. Um, and like Roderick said, he'd be happy to answer your questions towards the end of the program. We are running a little behind. So what I would like to do is to thank all of the speakers who participated in this part one of the session. And I am now going to hand over to the moderator for part two of our session, Isolina Boto, who is the head of networks and alliances at Koli ACP. She has more than 25 years of experience in agricultural development, and she's worked in various ACP embassies and NGOs in areas related to food security, rural development, trade, and agro-tourism. Isolina, I will hand it right over to you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roxanne, and thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation so far. So we are going to try to uh, go quickly to this panel, which is about the whole ecosystem of entrepreneurship. Uh, we have the importers, of course, and distributors. We have the finance part, and we have the research and data, all very important for uh, value chains, and especially for global value chains in terms of imports, with a particular focus today on the, on the EU uh, markets. European markets. So we will have two importers, distributors, an expert on finance and the research data. We will start straight away with Mr. Christophe Sureau, who is the CEO of Sural Sassic in France. Uh, he is the majority shareholder of the company, which is a French company created in 1958, which imports certified organic food products from different regions in the world, Sri Lanka, Denmark, Ecuador, Colombia, for the major to supply major retailers in France, which we all know, Carrefour, Auchan, Cora, etc. is really the biggest ones. Uh, he's also the CEO and the, the, the major shareholder of a Guyanese company, Amazon Caribbean Guyana, which harvests and packages organically grown picked herds of palm from Guyana. So he's uh, French, but he's also naturalized Guyanese. Um, and he has been ad, uh, appointed by the French prime minister as the trade advisor for France in Guyana. He's also uh, the president of the French National Union of Specialized Grocery Traders, as well as a um, French Federation, uh, administrator of the French Federation of Food Importers. And of course, it is Guyana as many parts in the world, but as a good uh, entrepreneur, uh, is always open, of course, to a new market as well and very attached to the Caribbean. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Suro, uh, in, uh, considering you also a uh, very busy time to join us today. Thank you very much, uh, Isolina. Um, ladies and gentlemen, they are members of ICA and Cole ACP, they are panelists uh, and guests uh, of the Caribbean, and I see a lot of guests also from Africa. Welcome, thank you for your invitation. Uh, a short introduction of uh, myself first, to explain a, a little uh, my story. Uh, my first job opportunity was in Guyana. It was in 1993. I'm married with a beautiful Guyanese, since 24 years, we have two children. Uh, and in terms of professional, I have two responsibilities. One in France as a CEO of a company, an importer company, and one in Guyana, as precise by Isolina. So we will, um, I will introduce to you our experience because it's kind of unique. We, we manage all the chain from the harvesters, from the farmers, up to the consumers, the supermarket chains, uh, passing through our agro industry. So if you can pass to the next slide, please. A little brief of the importer company that uh, I manage in France, Sura Sasik. Uh, this is a family owned company since uh, 1958, uh, created by my grandfather. We import and sell uh, can eat seafood, fruits and vegetables. Our products line uh, are going from the heart of palm from Guyana, some heart of palm from uh, South America, especially from Ecuador, tropical fruits uh, certified organic from Asia uh, and from uh, particularly uh, Thailand and Sri Lanka, some coconut milk, virgin coconut oil and cod liver for the seafood. Our main customers are the supermarket chains in France, uh, Carrefour, Leclerc, uh, Casino, etc. But we are also selling to the, the main uh, specialized organic certified retailers, uh, such as Biocop, La Vie Claire. You don't know them too much in the, uh, in the Caribbean, but they, they are really uh, strong in France. Our turnover is 7.6 million, and we are selling 6 million uh, units. Uh, that was the sales last year. Regarding Amazon Caribbean in Guyana, that's also a family-owned company uh, founded in 86. We have two factories, uh, one in the northwest of Guyana, not far from Venezuela, and one uh, in Region 5 in Burbis. We have 200 employees and we are working close with 500 harvesters who are supplying uh, the heart of palm. Um, and we, we have also uh, some, uh, some farm for pineapple 
and we are uh, also producing some acai juice. The acai berry is coming from the same palm, from the same heart of palm. Our main customers are EU, the North American market and Middle East, and our turnover is 3.5 million was last year, was very small due to, our, uh, to the pandemic. And we produce 50, uh, 53 containers last, last year. Normally we are producing about seven to 75 containers. Next slide, please. To go a little more on the product that uh, Guyana is supplying, the Heart of Palm. Once again, this is wild harvested. We call it in Guyana manicol, but you know it a little more about, about the acai palm, the species Euter oleracea. There is 2,000 2, species of palm uh, in the world. So only from this one, you can get the, uh, the wild Heart of Palm. Uh, the particularity of that activity is that it's mainly harvested by the indigenous communities in Guyana. Uh, again, we are working with 500 of those uh, independent uh, harvesters who are selling to us the fresh heart of palm. The logistic is quite complicated, but I will, I will go further about it. The regenerating and the sustainability of the palm, that's the main concern of our product, because apart to be organic, uh, we have also to show that uh, in terms of environmental, it's completely safe. Next slide, please. Now from this uh, heart of palm fresh, we are making an added value since uh, 35 years, selling uh, again to North America, to Europe, especially to France. Uh, the French like it, for instance, uh, in salads, they cut it, they chunk it, and they eat it in salads, but you can also appreciate it as appetizer in a dip sauce or simply as a snack. It's uh, rich in fiber and really low uh, in carb. So we, we can find it in glass jar, but also uh, in uh, cans. Next slide. The, the other project that we have is the pineapple uh, chunks. As you can see, that's also in glass jar. Uh, today we have we have really uh, difficulties uh, to say, and I will go uh, further about it to get it done uh, in Guyana. Uh, and I have with my company in France, I don't have another choice than to buy it from Asia, and that can give you some example of a part to be a challenge of the competitiveness that we have to look at in the Caribbean before to start looking at selling. The, the pineapple that we do in Glass Jar, apart than to be organic certified, is also a, a premium a product. There is no sugar added inside. The brine is only with pineapple juice, and the pineapple is chunks inside. It's pasteurized, so you have two years shelf life. Next slide. So as an importer, and I would say as a potential customer, uh, some of you say, okay, I have a customer in, in front of me. We all have to know that anyone that you touch, especially for Europe, and I will speak about France, you will not touch the final customer. Who is the final customer? That's the consumer first. And the second one is the supermarket chain, is the buyer. And in my job, every day, I have to deal with the buyer of the supermarket chain. And that's a tough job because Every day they want a cheaper price. Every day there is something. So when we work with a producer, with the agro-industry, agro but also with the harvesters, that's all the chain that we are working with. And that's what we are explaining to the buyer. So as an importer, I'm just a part. I'm just a partner of this chain. So I'm not there to give you some technical lessons, uh, how to export uh, all the customs documents, but to share my vision uh, of what, what would be the first question we should ask if we believe we have the right product. Again, the right product is not especially the one you like. Like if I just take the example of paper sauce, uh, if you want to sell it in France, I love paper sauce from Guyana. Uh, I love some brands. I know I see one from Jamaica that I already taste. It's a hot paper sauce, but sorry to say it, that will not fit to the market. So that just a few examples, make sure it fit to the market. You will find a net, an ethnic, ethnic uh, 
uh, market eventually, but not with some volumes enough. So the destination market, it's really important to know where I will it, I will sell it to. When you do an, an, uh, an added product, of course you use some, the raw material. Does my raw material is competitive for me to add it in my finished product? And that's the main point I would say on the first question. I have seen you, some of you are HSCCP certified. And some uh, of you have seen 22,000, which is great. But for, to sell on the French supermarket uh, shelves, you need to be IFS food certified. BRC as well, eventually. BRC is for the British, IFS are for uh, the, the European market. If you are not IFS certified, that will be very difficult to enter the market. Eventually, you can sell under your own brand. It's not mandatory. But it is mandatory if you want to sell under, let's say, Carrefour brand, the private label of the supermarket. That's mandatory to be IFS certified. That's 350 criteria from the management quality system. It's really strong. So that's also, do we have the capacity of uh, building that? And uh, an important point I feel is the social standards. Are you ready to be audited? in the social standards? And are you ready to fit with the standard ICS or BSCIs that the two social standards that any supermarket chain in France are requesting? Those standards especially mean initiative for compliance and sustainability. What does it mean? It means that we need uh, in your factory, you need to improve the condition of, for the people at work. What they will be checking, the security of the place, uh, is not the simple uh, fact of saying, is there any chain labor? Or is it, that's nothing about that. It's, of course, that's something basic. It's really strong. And this part, if we don't make that happen, you cannot even offer your product to the supermarket. So you have to pass the IFS food certification, ICS or BSCI certification. Uh, after about the packaging, I heard about the, the packaging as well, the difficulties of getting packaging today, that if you have plastic, for instance, if your content is in plastic, that's a nightmare to try to sell it in Europe. Everybody wants to get rid of plastic in Europe. So glass jar is better indeed, but today getting glass jar also supply, the price increase a lot and we have to import uh, the, the glass jar. So the packaging, you have to look at it. And the last, but that was already mentioned previously about the label, the label um, certi certification, the label regulation, deep on, it's not because you are in Europe that you will have your label from France that fit for Germany. You have to, it's two different standards. Every country in Europe, they have their own specification. So you have one on Europe on the head, global specification, and then you have one for France, for Italy, for Spain. And so depending on your destination, you have to adapt your label. And that's a lot to put inside. Next slide, slide please. So a, a few advice, if I may have, um, as I say, to be competitive. Let me take the example of pineapple that today, unfortunately, I have to buy it from Asia. Um, Guyana is a great country. You have beautiful pineapple all over the, the, the Caribbean. When I see the price that any farmers will be selling the pineapple, fresh pineapple to our factory, that's impossible to compete with other markets. Why? Because a pineapple today, just an example, is about $1.5 a kilo. In Asia, organic certified, organic certified is between 20 to 30 cents a kilo. So how you want to make a nice glass jar that then you to be able to compete with that market. So it's not like the, again, the farmers are making money over it. It's not because the price are, 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 is high because they want to make money. It's because it's not efficient in the farming. Another example with pineapple in uh, Guyana, uh, they, they are putting 3,500 plants per acre. Uh, in uh, Asia, in Thailand or Sri Lanka, is five times more per acre. 
So of course you have a, you're more efficient, you're much more cheaper. And there's a technique over it. It's not so difficult. But what we hear is that I know to do that since generation. Nobody will change how the way I can do it. So then the price is expensive. So depending on the product, again, uh, raw material, that's important. Target the niche market um, for your final product. Uh, don't try to compete with mass, mass market, a huge market. If you say, okay, I see this product in the US market or Europe, I will try to compete. Let's not try on that. Go for a premium, but I have seen it already with the participant before, um, with the organic certification and fair trade, if also you can be satisfied fair trade. Another, another advice as well, we all know Mexican cuisine, Japanese cuisine, Chinese cuisine, Thai cuisine. What about Caribbean cuisine? What about, I see a lot of brothers and sisters from Africa listening to us. What about African cuisine in, on the shelves? We don't see them a lot. It's all on ethnic. So we have to make it more famous, like the Mexican, Japanese, Chinese, Thai cuisine made that happen. And it's so fantastic food that we have in Caribbean and also in Africa that we can make that happen. And again, the last part I say, don't believe again, you, you, you have, we always have the best product, but look at what your customer like first. Next slide, please. So some challenges, I've already seen um, uh, some of that you precise. For, for my point of view, and I will take the, the other cap of uh, Amazon Caribbean in Guyana, is a local logistics. There also is a nightmare to move from one part of the country to the other. And that's due mainly because there is not much cargo vessels, small cargo vessels. In Guyana, for instance, we don't have much roads, we have rivers, and we don't have uh, uh, vessels to charter to go one point to the other. It's a nightmare. The other aspect is the international logistics. We have, not in all the countries uh, in, in the Caribbean, but if I take the example of Suriname or, or Guyana, we have a poor infrastructure that actually limit the access to those big vessels. International vessels like Apagloid, CMA, CGM, they are not coming. What they are doing, they are sending small feeders, small boats. So added cost, and that's due to what? Because the, 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 the water is not deep enough. So of course, all governments are speaking about deep waters, but that will not come right now. We're gonna have to wait quite some time. But what's scaring me is the next point. Next year, there is a new uh, regulation from IMO, the International Maritime Organization, which belongs to a United Nation, that's uh, pushing all the cargo vessels to reduce their carbon emission. That means that most, uh, a lot at least, that's what I heard from the, the, some big uh, maritime companies, most of the vessels in the Caribbean, the feeders, will have to, um, will have to go to, uh, to, to be destroyed. So it has to be renewed. When you ask, what is your strategy to those comp uh, maritime companies? Would you have any feeders? They say, no, everything is built in China today, big cargo. So what will be next in the Caribbean for feeders? So this is One really minute. scary. Yeah. yeah, okay. And to, ex to, uh, to export, we need to be certified, as I said just before, but you need accredited auditors. It's really hard to get accredited auditors in the Caribbean. It's most of them coming from South America or Europe or North America. Next slide, please. And this, I will uh, finish completing with some example of uh, products that I put that I know for sure we need in uh, France uh, and the rest of Europe. You see uh, writing there, coconut milk, coconut water, virgin coconut oil, tropical fruit juice, uh, even up to uh, cashew nuts. And um, I will finish to conclude that we need to join as entrepreneurs to build up this trend cuisine from the Caribbean. The, the, the West Indies cuisine, including Barbados, Guyana, Suriname, Trinidad, and all the beautiful islands, we all love the food. The European customers are waiting for you to discover it. And, and um, as, as um, the Car Caribbean songs for 
for us like music, whining dance, loving spicy food, nice beaches, coconut, and the sun. So please, please bring the sun to our supermarket. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very uh, inspiring and uh, really uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. It will answer already many of the questions. Uh, so we are a bit behind, but I'm sure that there will be less questions because everything almost is answered. Just follow in the chat some kind of bilateral of people uh, wondering if you know you, you are interested in markets in some African countries, etc. So without major delay, uh, René, René Dronman is another importer uh, in uh, into um, countries in the EU, is the founder and director of the René Nordam uh, Nordam Group. Uh, is uh, Dutch origin, but living in uh, Poland since 2005. Is uh, very very attached uh, to farming, uh, um, and he started a, a business there. He now imports uh, Dutch fruits and vegetables to Eastern Europe, and he uh, imports specifically exotic fruits and citrus uh, from uh, Dominican Republic uh, as well. He is himself as well a, a distributor, so he will uh, tell us a bit more on uh, what he does. Please, René, uh, as soon as you can. Buddy. Thank you very much. Hello, good, hello, good, uh, good morning, all. Um, my name is René Nordam from the um, René Nordam Group with companies in the, in the Netherlands, Dominican Republic, and, uh, and Poland. We are importing and exporting fresh fruit from, from all over the world to Europe. <clears throat> Sorry. And our, our clients are wholesale markets, importers and retailers. Um, as you could hear in the, in the introduction, uh, I raised up in a real Dutch farming and trading family. And uh, today I would like to, to tell you uh, the story how we started in the Dominican Republic. Um, and that was a, a really long and, and, and difficult process. Uh, we was importing pineapples from, from Costa Rica for some years already. And I was not satisfied about, uh, um, about the quality and was looking for an alternative. So after some research, I, I found out that the uh, transit time from Dominican Republic um, was three, four days shorter uh, than from, from Costa Rica. So in uh, February, 2017, uh, we bought the first containers with, with pineapples uh, from a Dominican exporter and they arrived in Holland um, with, with many quality problems. Um, quality problems with, uh, with the fruit, but also the boxes were, uh, were, were not strong enough. Um, so, we decided to, to buy a ticket and to go to the Dominican Republic to see the, the, the country by, by ourselves. Totally not with the idea for to, for to start our own companies there. So um, a local fruit expert uh, will help us with the, with the export documents um, for, the, for the first containers, drove me around uh, the country uh, for, for a full week and showed me, me many farms and what, what I saw was, um, was really, really a potential in, 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 that, um, in that country. So I, I was really impressed. And uh, six weeks later, uh, I was there again uh, to take another look. Um, and I noticed that high quality fruit was, was grown almost in every farm. Um, one second. Uh, but there was much to improve in the, in the, in the packing, uh, packing process. And during this, uh, these trips, we, we, we got the idea for to, um, for to start our own export company in the, uh, in the Dominican Republic, specialized in pineapples. And um, we, we visit many growers and we, uh, we try to, to bind them to us uh, as, as partners. Partners that we wanted to advise with, with my experience uh, that I have gained over, uh, over the years. And finally, in 
in March 2018, uh, we started to, uh, to, to export our first pineapples. And to, to manage the, the, the process better, I decided to, uh, in 2018 as well um, to, um, to move to the Dominican Republic to be closer to the, to the, to the whole process. And after many, many startup problems, um, our vision started to, to work. Um, and in the beginning of 2020, I became a shareholder in a new organic banana export company founded by, uh, by 12 banana producers with the idea to uh, exporting our own bananas. Um, and I became uh, responsible for the sales and promotion. And the first customers were, were, found, uh, were found soon. And then the, uh, uh, came the corona pandemic. Uh, we could no longer sell the air freight pineapples, what we sold in our own developed um, single box, because there was no, there was no, uh, no plane flying, and later the, the air freight doubled, so it was too, too expensive uh, for our clients in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. The only product what we could, what we could sell, um, what we could sell was, uh, was our our bananas, because these were, were, were programmed for a, for a whole year already, and this we could send by, um, by containers. So we had to, uh, to adjust our plans and decide to expand our range with, uh, uh, with mango and, and, and tropical avocado. And what I have learned in my time in the, in the Dominican Republic is to work very closely with your, with your growers. And I don't know if there are growers here right now uh, listening to me, but my advice to, to you all is to, to see your customer, not only as a customer, but as a partner. Consult and listen uh, each other needs. Which certification is needed? Uh, what are the requested specifications for the fruit? Um, maybe we can, you, can, you can develop a brand together with your uh, with your client, create a win-win situation for, uh, for, for, for you both. And this is what we uh, in the Rene Nordam group always try to create with our, our suppliers and, and clients, thinking in a, in a long-term cooperation and not in one quick, uh, quick seal. Um, in this moment, I am, I am traveling um, between Dominican Republic, the Netherlands, and Poland all, all the time. Um, and we are, we are still expanding. We are, um, we are importing um, also from, from other, other companies, uh, fresh fruit to, to Europe. And uh, what we are doing as well um, is we are providing agricultural consulting projects um, this is what I personally, personal really, uh, really like to, to do, to share my, my agricultural and sales experience with, uh, with others in the, in the world. And um, if there is anybody here uh, interesting in, in a cooperation with us, um, please try to, to contact me and um, we will speak about this, this uh, with each other. I would like to to thank thank you all for your uh, you all for for your interesting and feel free for to for to ask me something. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Rene, from uh, for joining uh, from Poland. Uh, and um, uh, indeed, people will uh, will certainly have questions for you. And thank you for bringing that part of the of the small order of producers. I saw some questions in that in that sense as well. I've posted some questions on the question answer because they were in the chat for some of our speakers, which are a bit more bilateral. And there are some indeed about the relation uh, with the small holders and indeed all this area of skills and reskilling them as to uh, uh, produce quality, uh, quality food, which Christophe was mentioning is really in demand by the consumers and unfortunately is not negotiable. So without major delay now, let's go to the finance, which is also a very important point. We have uh, Leo William 
comes uh, with us from the um, Inter-American Development Bank. He's the managing director of a new private equity fund in the region. He has a very long-standing 25 years of experience in investment and business consulting in the region and in the US. Uh, prior to joining SEIF, he worked as an investment advisory uh, firm focusing on uh, uh, raising capital for firms in Jamaica and the wider Caribbean region. Uh, he's also a background on, on finance. I mean, uh, manager of Jamaican money market brokers, as well as in the Dominican Republic, as well as the former director of the Jamaican Stock Exchange. So indeed, I think that we have really the right person with us answering some of the pressing questions uh, from uh, the entrepreneurs at some point uh, in their in their the development of the business is not always the first thing they ask. ICA or Cole ACP, uh, but is at some point, of course, a critical one is accessing funds. And you will know better than me that sometimes those funds are available everywhere, are not necessible, uh, necess um, necessarily sorry, uh, accessible by the, the, you know, the SMEs, more the SMEs type. So if you could give us shortly, um, in five, six minutes, uh, some insights on how do you see that and what you can offer uh, to uh, especially SMEs. Thank you very much uh, for being with us, Leo. You are muted, I think. You, yeah. Good morning, Isolina. Uh, maybe you can hear me now. And uh, can you see the slide? Can. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us to be here. We're glad to be able to participate. The uh, forum has introduced many interesting concepts of the Caribbean. Our fund is a Caribbean growth investments fund, which is of the type private equity. And so we started in October of 2019. We raised capital and we're focused on no particular sector. We're industry agnostic, but we're focused on the Caribbean region. We look for companies that are in any of these sectors that uh, have an opportunity to grow two, three, four times. And we try to work with the companies, the entrepreneurs, to identify a growth strategy and implement that strategy over the next three or four years. Our uh, activity is um, an activity that has gone on for many years in many parts of the world, but this fund is one of the newer funds of the region. We're based in Kingston and we operate throughout the region. Our first investment was actually in Ghana. So I was glad to hear from Mr. Christophe Sui about uh, the work that's been done there with exporting uh, to France. But we have invested in a portfolio company that is in the retail food sector. And so they sell in Ghana, a number of different brands of food in the quick service category. Our second investment was in Jamaica and it's a renewable energy financing company that's looking to facilitate the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And so the financing that we provide helps to make the uh, capital expenditure to transition to renewable energy much easier. Um, I'll give a little more information as we speak, but um, just as a disclaimer, the work that we do is regulated in the region and it's also regulated in the United States. Um, we are a private equity fund and so we do not offer investment advice or investments to retail or individual um, investors. We provide uh, information to accredited investors who are registered with the regulatory organizations or with their um, local country um, uh, private sector organizations. And so we provide information at a company to company level. Um, when we started the fund in September of 2020, our objective was to reach a target of about $75 million US. We currently are at about 45 million with our second close and we should be at 55 million in another month or two. Um, the activity that we do seeks to identify uh, companies that are able to grow. Um, we look for opportunities for maybe buyout, either majority or minority stake, but we prefer the ability to control the investment and to have 
uh, uh, the ability to drive the exit. The exit can be, for example, on the, the local stock exchanges of either Jamaica or Trinidad or Barbados, or it could even be on one of the European stock exchanges, as you might um, expect. We, we look to do about eight or, or 10 transactions. Each of those transactions would be in the range of two to three million US dollars. And um, we invest, grow the companies, and then divest over a period of about another five years. So by 2029, we've reached the end of the fund, and we would have divested from all of our investments at that point in time. In terms of the countries that uh, we target, there are uh, we've identified on this chart the, the countries of the English-speaking Caribbean mostly, but um, I see your presenter, uh, Rene Nordam, just spoke about the Dominican Republic. We would look at the Dominican Republic if there are companies in the English-speaking Caribbean that are interested in expanding to those um, markets as well, either Haiti or the Dominican Republic. We would also look at Belize, and uh, we're currently exploring an opportunity in Suriname. The, the company SEEP has been uh, in operation for more than 30 years. Uh, the 30 year anniversary was actually 2021 and uh, has invested in a number of companies. Uh, we've exited from about 440 investments um, um, over the years and, and we've managed about 40 funds. And so this fund is the first in the region, but it is not the first. Um, um, it is the first in the region, but not the first in the group. Our, our impact um, focus is very unique. We're one of the few funds in the private equity category that seeks to ensure that we have an impact. Um, when we look for impact, we describe the themes as either climate resilience or food security or inclusion. And uh, we tend to look for those as overlays to our investment metrics. So once we've identified the company, we'll evaluate the opportunity to um, have a positive effect on improving the climate uh, resilience uh, within that sector or within that company. We'll also look to see if there are metrics that uh, we can drive to enhance or strengthen food security or to ensure better balance and uh, better participation and inclusion from a gender perspective. And so our initial um, two investments I just described, we're also looking at a number of other um, opportunities in the pharmaceutical space or cloud space in um, the healthcare or even um, other backward integration or vertical integrated opportunities. Um, I, I'd like to introduce the team we have uh, with us, a uh, very senior executive, the founder of the company, Mr. Bert Van der Vaart, um, uh, Jamal Abisoror, Gerard Johnson, Ms. Holly Nishat, and our finance administration person, Mark Grant, and of course, myself. And then of course, we have an investment uh, committee that evaluates the opportunities we put forward to uh, ensure that the best ideas are actually admitted to the fund from a performance perspective. And so we have this independent um, investment committee review on each of the investments we put forward. What I'd like to, to uh, mention is that our review is seeking not just to identify companies that can meet our growth targets, but we also look to make sure that um, we provide financing of the equity uh, category. So we. We're not a lender. We typically work alongside banks and other lenders of uh, capital. But we provide equity, either primary or secondary um, sources, um, preference share or common share um, investments. And we do that for a long time frame, long meaning four to five years. The work that we do also involves some technical assistance. This is where IDB comes in. One of our partner investors is the IDB and they've provided technical assistance um, in a category that um, can help the company to grow. In one case, the technical assistance is with the supply chain and logistics. In another case, it's with climate resilience and um, helping with uh, some of the governance activities that could, could happen within the company. 
So we also look to ensure that the corporate governance and the leadership of the company is, is um, enhanced and that it's uh, functioning and performing well. And um, our process goes from an origination to evaluation. Typically, that might take three to four months um, closing. And then the portfolio management stage uh, might be several years and finally our exit. And so in each case, uh, we customize our treatment and our planning, but uh, that's the general approach that we take. Um, generally, what you find is private equity is very useful for entrepreneurs and SME um, um, companies that are seeking patient capital that can help them grow. It also is coupled with advisory and um, um, different metrics um, to help strengthen the company performance from an operational perspective. We look as well to see if there are opportunities to merge or to combine operations with other companies in the same sector or to expand in areas that help the company grow its bottom line. Typically, we look at metrics like the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And we look at valuing the companies initially as we go along and make changes and then as we exit. And so given the uh, disruptions that have taken place in COVID uh, recently in the region, we've seen uh, uh, a downturn in the number of companies we look at in the agricultural and tourism sector. But as we emerge from that um, effect, those effects of the pandemic, we do see more activity and more opportunity for companies to be able to grow um, in these areas. And so we'd be interested to look at companies such as those you've profiled that um, might be able to accept capital to be able to grow regionally and to expand um, their markets, um, both the markets of sourcing as well as their markets of distribution. One minute, Leo. Well, I'm actually done. Uh -huh. so, well, then less. <laughs> here is uh, the one second. For the, uh, the firm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will share uh, the PowerPoint, of course, all the PowerPoints will be shared. Very, very interesting. I have the last very quick, and please look again at the, at the questions of Kuhn, as is my colleague. Uh, he will have, uh, of course, no choice than, uh, than to make it short to help us to uh, uh, recover the time. Kuhn is our market insights manager. Uh, he's a bioscience engineer specialized in uh, tropical crop production. Uh, he, does, uh, he has experience in many African and Caribbean Caribbean countries. And the reason he's speaking today is because we just re released a, a, a quantitative qualitative study on actually uh, the imports uh, from the Caribbean products in fruits and vegetables in particular uh, to uh, Europe. Uh, so we thought it was very, very timely that he shares very, very quickly, um, uh, you know, some, some trends. So thank you in advance, Kuhn, for, uh, yes, a, a quick uh, overview. Please go ahead. Thank you, Isolina, for this introduction. And so, hello, everybody. I'm Kuhn van der Hagen, Market Insights uh, Department Manager at Call ACP, and I will present you a few key findings of our recently published market study of fruit and vegetables from the ACP Caribbean countries. Um, but first, let me introduce to you quickly our department. So, um, Market Insights, we provide quantitative and qualitative information about market trends, market access, consumer trends, etc., to support action plans at the service of small and medium-sized enterprises in the agricultural industry, mainly in the fruit and vegetable sector. And all our activities are financed by programs, mainly by the EU and the organization of ACP countries. Um, so the market study, I will start with a word on the scope and the methodology. Um, so the scope geographically, it covers 16 countries of the ACP Caribbean region. And we focus on five focus countries being the Dominican Republic, Guyana, Jamaica, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago. We cover fruits, vegetables, spices, and processed fruit and vegetables. And we talk about production, imports, exports, effects of external phenoma, phenomena on consumer trends and trade. And we also do a SWOT analysis at the end. Um, 
This market study was elaborated in the framework of the CoLACP Fit for Market and Fit for Market SPS programs. So regarding the methodology, this study was mainly done remotely uh, due to the COVID-19 situation, but part of the team of experts was based in the Caribbean islands. And we also interviewed many local stakeholders, uh, which allowed us to include firsthand information and also to ensure that the data trends that we observed were confirmed by the local realities. Uh, we consulted several databases, they are listed here. And in the study, we both considered the impacts of general aspects, as well as local policies, um, following our internal will to be macroeconomic, but also operational for the SMEs. So let me now share some key results and conclusions of the study. Um, regarding production, there are four leading producers, Dominican Republic, well, leading in terms of fruit and vegetable production, of course, uh, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Haiti, and Jamaica. Um, only fruit and vegetable production of Dominican Republic increased over uh, the assessed period um, to about 7.2 million tons in 2019. Um, the other produce, uh, the key top producers had a more or less stable production and even a slight decline over the, the period. Um, when we see at the total production trend in the region, we see that uh, it, the, the increase is mainly driven by uh, fruit and vegetables. Uh, yeah, by the, the fruits actually. Um, vegetables, roots, tubers, pulses, uh, they all remained relatively stable. And uh, the increase of fruit was mainly driven by the increase in banana production, which happened mostly between 2000 and 2009 and 2014, uh, and after that it stabilized. But uh, in the more recent years, we have a strong growth in, for example, avocado production, uh, some pineapple and papaya, and this pushed the growth of uh, fruit production further. Um, but there were also some fruits that had a negative growth over this period. So for example, citrus and grapefruit, um, the production reduced. Um, in the study that is published, uh, we focus in detail on a selection of more than 20 crops. So you can read it all there uh, in more detail. Then about imports, uh, we identified four leading suppliers. Um, so imports from the world going to the Caribbean. So the main uh, suppliers are USA and Canada and also Netherlands and China. About imported products, we see that from North America, it are mainly fresh and frozen potato, um, dried pulses and beans, apples, grapes, apple juice, and many other products, uh, America being the main supplier of products to the fruit and vegetable products to the Caribbean region. From EU, there are also quite some imports, uh, mainly fresh and frozen potato and onions uh, from the Netherlands, for example. And uh, from Asia, we see uh, imports of processed products such as tomato products, but also garlic and beans. And then internally from the Caribbean region, uh, it are mainly juices, coconuts and legumes that are imported. Um, in general, we see that the import volumes and values remain relatively stable over the assessment period. Um, no big changes. When we look at the exports, we can see that there are traditionally the UK and USA are the main markets, but also the EU 27 is a main destination market. Um, there is one leading product, uh, banana, and one leading country that is the Dominican Republic. However, um, we see a diversification going on in both in terms of destination markets and products. Uh, we observe a reduction in volume share of the exports to the US and the UK. Um, and we see that more and more exports are directed uh, directly to the EU 27 countries, for example, to Sweden directly or to Germany. And we also see that there is a shift going on of exports that was previously coming through the UK and then going to Europe 
um, and it's now shifting to direct imports by the Netherlands, France, and Belgium. And already in 2019, so this is before the Brexit, we could see this happening in anticipation of the Brexit. Um, in terms of products, uh, we see that banana exports have stabilized, but uh, we see progress in exports of avocado, mango, ethnic roots and tubers, and also of organic products. And the latter ones are of course, mainly from Dominican Republic. Um, then uh, about the market opportunities, we are positive besides logistic interruptions. Uh, we can also see some positive trends coming from the COVID-19 pandemic. We see that globally, the fruit and vegetable consumption is rising and the demand is rising. And so we, we see that there is an opportunity for the Caribbean region to continue diversifying its exports. Uh, not only to the large Caribbean diaspora worldwide, but also to other consumers, uh, for example, in the mainland EU. On the domestic market, we see opportunities to further valorize primary products by processing them and targeting the large Caribbean population. Um, also prepared fruit and vegetables for the tourism sector is still an opportunity when it will flourish again, hopefully soon. Um, substitution of imports, so mainly of the fresh frozen and, and fries made by uh, white potato. Um, so this could be substituted by local uh, roots and tubers, for example, fries made from cassava or sweet potatoes, or maybe from uh, domestically produced white potatoes. And then at the international markets, we see opportunities uh, that are already confirmed sometimes by increasing exports, uh, for example, of avocado, pineapple, banana, coconut, mango, and others. And um, as said, the continuous growth in demand for organic products. So this is an example of a summary we, we use in our, in our market study where we can see the opportunities per crop and per market. Um, and this and much more other information can be found in the study that is about 140 pages. And um, yeah, it can be downloaded for free uh, after you send us a, a simple request via the link on this website, on this slide, sorry. And uh, other questions can always be addressed to the, the, the email address also mentioned here. Um, finally, a small overview of activities, other activities done by Colispe to support the uh, export markets. And I invite you to check our website to find more information on that. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. Very much, Kun. Very appreciated that you did in a few minutes, and indeed some of our services. I see a question actually in the chat on the Julio Alejandro. I think from the regulations to the EU, you know, from the EU Green Deal, and now, for example, DR can Dominican Republic can comply with the pesticide requirements, etc. Well, that's one of the areas, for example, of work of some of my colleagues. So we can guide you between ECAN, Colacp, and of course other partners to very, very specific support, you know, on, on areas which are extremely complex. And of course, we can't deal with them just now. So thank you very much. Uh, what I will propose to do is quickly uh, uh, go back to our uh, dear uh, colleagues uh, from the Caribbean that presented uh, in the first part. You have heard uh, the importers and what they need, what the market requires, what the consumer requires, what the standards require. Uh, you have heard the finance and a bit, of course, uh, data that is needed to, to better know the, the market. So I will ask you, Roy, Daphne and Roderick, if uh, you, what, what would you like to add that you didn't have a chance uh, to say? Uh, I have mentioned to you some bilateral questions about, you know, your exports yearly, et cetera, which perhaps, you know, is more uh, to put in the chat. But I will give you uh, two minutes, please, to uh, tell us anything that you would like to stress that hasn't been said or, or you know, insights. Please, Roy, I start by you in the same order.
are muted. You are muted. And then I will ask our two importers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Um, one of the major things that I've missed earlier in my presentation was one of the things that, that's affecting us most right now, even though it was mentioned by some of my colleagues, yeah, and that was the available availability of important packaging materials that are manufactured in the region in order to support our manufacturing facilities. Um, we have had glass bottle companies in Jamaica before, but they have all moved out and shut down to where they have gone. And now we have to be defending Poli and China and other countries which are prioritizing their countries before we can get anything here. We have a local packaging company here that is also an international company, a subsidiary of an international company. But we cannot get a lot of the packaging that is required right now to carry some more of our major product lines, production. Yeah, so in light of all that, you're scared to borrow. You, know what I'm you don't know what to do. It's a lot of uncertainty, and you're not getting much information from them. I think that is threatening our industry more so than anything else right now. As we do a lot of canning, and our bread and basket, our bread basket lines lies within the canning right now. And it's a big issue for us in Jamaica right now. As we do not see a way forward, we are seeking to import from what it, it's taking six months. The level of capitalization that will be required in order to hold packaging material for six months before harvesting season, it's going to be catastrophic. You know what I'm saying? And hence, it will be threatening livelihoods in Jamaica. And the great demand also now for procuring raw materials along the supply chain because, lo because of logistic issues. Yeah, the amounts that you have to do and hold in advance. It requires huge sums of money, all happening within a two year span, and that is putting significant pressures on us. Yeah. While we are diversifying with new products that are able to sell locally, what if we cannot get the packaging material, like some plastics, et cetera, to sell them locally? What do we do? So we need to have inputs in our countries using maybe some research and development, some form of local material that can offer some level of packaging. Yeah. It's not all, and I'm more dependable and reliable source of supply. Thank, thank you, me. thank you very much. And indeed, packaging, as Christoph told us, you know, you have really to look at some of the markets because if not, you will be out because uh, some of the materials are not accepted. And it links to the quality and it links to the labeling, which sure. is also very, very important uh, for some of very the markets. So. Thank so. you so much. Very insightful. Daphne, please. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I would want to emphasize is that sometimes, you know, bigger doesn't always mean better. And uh, this goes, in a sense, against the objective of today with exports. Um, you have to really analyze what your costs are, all of your costs thoroughly with the shipping, everything. Um, and and uh, my partner was very, you know, it's, it's, it's a real challenge for the supply chain right now, getting materials in, getting packaging in, um, which is one of the reasons why we had to shrink our product line. In the Bahamas, we are focusing more on trying to establish a secure local market. You know, don't overlook the people right next to you and develop those partner industries. Definitely what challenges, challenges you are having, other companies, maybe not with the same product, but developing any kind of production they are having. So if you can partner, hold hands and share costs and share experiences, sometimes we try to keep everything inside because we're trying to protect our industry. That's not working in today's world. We have to open up Explain, uh, having engagement with other companies and see where each other can hold hands and help, okay? Develop those partnerships, most, most important, and don't overlook your local market. You know, be the best at what you can be at home and then expand. 
Thank you very much, Daphne. And indeed, you know, these uh, 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 very specific smaller products could be linked to some of, I think, the first presenter made on geographical indications or organic or niche markets, you know, very specific quality markets, which are not necessarily quantity, but qualitative. However, in the Caribbean, it was also mentioned uh, the tourism industry is so important. So it is local, but at the same time, it has the characteristics of the export markets because it's a very demanding market as well. Huh? Uh, the big uh, hotels, et cetera, et cetera. So is, is, is yes, that quality and that targeting also. Uh, from, from our experience at Cole ACP, the companies, even, including in Africa, the companies that have been exp exporting, and correct me, Kun, if I'm wrong, they've been exporting to the EU, et cetera. When they go to the local markets or regional markets, they, perf they perform much better because, you know, they have very high standards, very high uh, food and safety, etc. So it helps even them in the local markets. Absolutely. If I just might highlight that point about the tourist market, your local tourist market is your biggest export marketing avenue. Make sure your labels have all the information on it that people can get in touch with you. The only reason that we went into the export market was the demand of our tourists visiting the country who wanted our product. So that is the strongest alliance. Your strongest alliance is your tourist outlets, your gift stores within your own local market. And it's the less challenging one. Thank you very Thank much. You. Rod Roderick? Thank you. Thank you. I would say um, I saw some question regarding the issue of climate change. That is a big issue for us. Um, both in terms of the storms and, and hurricanes and floods and so on from the production standpoint, but also from the drying process, which is a very natural air dry. So those those are some factors that we, we have to play with. I think from the, the, the future, where we can add more value, the issue of packaging is a significant issue, significant um, in that if you want to have innovation, particularly our nutmeg value added products that we are looking at, they are niche products. These products are not, some of these products don't even exist in like in other type of brands or so because there's nutmeg base, you have to have the pods which are um, produced from a nutmeg tree. So it's happening right in Grenada. And so I, I listen closely to Chris, Christopher, Christophe, and I, I look at what he is doing in Guyana, not to show he's rich, but I think I would like to have some sort of bilateral with him at some time so we can see how we can look at opportunities in those areas. And I agree with Daphne, the issue of our local market in terms of connection with the tourist sector, which is a major sector in Grenada, um, and the food and all of these, and that's why we look at a lot of food items, that integration we think would spice up <laughs> that whole part that Christopher has been speaking about all year. So I think this is my, my addition. Thank you very much. So without a delay, Christoph, uh, there are some uh, kind of also of questions uh, for you, but also you had a few points you perhaps wanted to stress more. I know that logistic is key and transport because if not, you cannot uh, send anything at, uh, at some uh, kind of scale. And the sustainability, which is also, of course, very key. Uh, Call ACP, uh, we have a big part of importers to the EU and it's non-negotiable and will be less and less negotiable be uh, on environmental standards, social standards, as you have mentioned. I saw a lot of input to the chat on the social standards, which some sometimes are not completely, of course, appreciated in the same way, uh, understandably. So, Christophe, what, what else could you tell us from your great experience? I, I don't know if she's a great experience, but uh, it, it's becoming more and more difficult, to be honest. Uh, that's that's uh, every day, again, when I say I'm in front of a buyer, actually, it's a... It's, uh, a big team, including uh, some uh, quality uh, manager from the supermarket chain, the uh, environmental manager from the supermarket chain, the packaging manager from the supermarket. So you have a whole set of team. Before you used to have one buyer. You negotiate, deal done. Today, it's getting bigger and bigger. And, uh, and uh, the, the next step, so we, we start with HSCCP. That was 15 years ago. Now we have this IFS, we have these social standards, and the one coming uh, 
quite soon is the um, um, low carbon um, uh, index that will be uh, putting uh, one day on the labels. That means today you have uh, for the um, uh, health uh, part, you have a Nutri score uh, on the labels that it's not mandatory, but it might come soon uh, as a European regulation uh, on all labels. Um, uh, it's green, that means it's good. Uh, red means it's not good. So simply as that, but um, uh, for some products, it's kind of difficult just to, to say that soon it will be with a low carbon emission eco score on the label. So you can see how it's, it's getting really, uh, again, difficult. So uh, in your company, you will have at the point, if you don't have as yet, you will have a quality manager, social manager, environmental manager. So <laughs> that's um, it's a reality. And that's how it is going. It's for some good points. You're speaking about hurricanes, that's for the environment. We're speaking about some uh, working condition, that's the social. Uh, and, and, and then we are working for the quality of the product, and that's the IFS. Thank you, thank you very much. And indeed, the more and more the entrepreneurs, it relates to a point you said before in your presentation, that it's key as well that entrepreneurs get together and share experience because it's so much uh, going on that uh, you know uh, you, you have uh, really to uh, keep updated and work together. Uh, so Rene, uh, from your side, do you have um, uh, um, uh, something else to add that you had no opportunity to say after hearing uh, the others? Uh, no, from from my side, I think I, 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 I told everything. I think you had some questions, but you had mentioned already uh, before on the on the farmers, on the smallholders as well. Uh, it's another. I don't want to open too much because it's another key complex area on on uh, you know upgrading their skills as well and reskilling each of them and uh, uh, going also online and uh, you know all this type of work. But um, uh, great then. Uh, so if you have n uh, nothing else to add. Kuhn, uh, you, you are working on logistics, so uh, can you just uh, quickly remind me on that uh, one word? Yes, Isolina, this is maybe something interesting to share because our market study was based on data before COVID and before Brexit. But recently we published another study, a study uh, which was requested by VEABS, the Horticulture Export Organization of Suriname. And we carried out a, a study for them on the logistic options to export from Suriname to the world. But it's also very relevant for the other Caribbean countries because we, we, we mapped actually the export, uh, the logistical options in terms of sea freight, air freight, uh, possibilities to make combinations um, and it's very uh, practical and relevant study which is uh, free we can make it available to all the people here um, normally it's only for our members but uh, with this cooperation between IICA and ACP, I think we can make it freely available for who is interested so feel free to to request it via the the emailing link Thank you. Thank you, Kuhn. Uh, Leo, uh, your presentation was uh, quite extensive and will be shared because it's also very practical on how uh, to access uh, support. But do you have anything else? Ah, thank you. Well, I think it's been a great conversation, a great discussion. We see some of the texture of what the challenges are in the region. Um, entrepreneurs are very interested in accessing capital, and um, that capital is many times not just bank borrowing. And so when the entrepreneur is prepared to, um, to take on a partner, an equity partner who can work with them for the long run, a solution like ours, private equity um, investment can help both identify a source of capital as well as some of the technical expertise that would be quite required in order to steer and navigate the growth that the company would like to achieve in the next few years. And so we think it's a, a great time coming out of of uh, COVID and looking at what's happening with interest rates globally with fuel prices. It's really important that uh, companies get a very stable partner that is able to work with them in the long run to resume their growth trajectory. And uh, that's what we're looking to do. So in any of the sectors that we've discussed, particularly those in this conversation in agriculture and 
and uh, with exports. We'd be interested in, in speaking more with some of the partners, um, some of the projects and some of the entrepreneurs that are available. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And as uh, ECA and Cole ACP, we will also follow up uh, closely how we could uh, collaborate. So I think this, before giving the floor to Alistair from my side, I thank you all uh, very, very much. There is a whole range, of course, of areas that we need uh, to, that we have raised, huh? uh, knowing the export country, which all the area of certification, market research, logistics, labeling, etc the sustainability of the business on the diversification, uh, uh, social standards, energy and, and capital. Um, but I think, um, uh, I mean, Alistair, that we could consider based, of course, on feedback, huh, as you mentioned at the beginning, that we received from all of you, of you looking perhaps at the packaging, shipping and some of the key areas that have been uh, raised today. I mean, many, but all very important. And Alistair, I don't remember if you said at the beginning as well that uh, this activity which we like very much with ICA is a conversation as someone has said and it's just the beginning of something uh, but we, we have all sorts of other activities that go together um, participation to fairs b2b linking to capital you know many others uh, that that support the entrepreneurs because we are very very grateful for the time you mobilize which is money for an entrepreneur and for all of us so there are other things that we will uh, contact you other activities we will contact you uh, for as well so thank you very much from my side to my colleagues of ICA, to uh, the speakers and to all the participants. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Alistair, please, you were very quiet. <laughs> we can't hear you, Alistair, we can't hear you. No, we can't, at least myself. I don't know if it's... Uh, okay, so I see Kun telling no. We just can't hear you. Um, you will, in the meantime, I just tried to tell you, you will receive all the presentations. No, 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 no. Uh, Alistair? No. Uh, you will receive all the presentations as it was mentioned, uh, as well the recording of this uh, of this uh, session. You will uh, receive as well a key summary of the of the of the issues discussed and uh, information if you are interested of some of our parallel activities, you know, uh, as I was mentioning before, the B2B, the first, the, the get into contact with importers, with producers, with new markets. I, I forgot to mention uh, before, Alistair, you come in when you have the sound. I, okay. I, I, let let I me know if you're hearing me. Yes. Yes. Oh, now, okay. yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Sincere apologies. The technology sometimes gives us a bit of difficulty. Uh, again, Isolina, let me thank you and your team for the excellent support, the excellent collaboration. Uh, I want to express my gratitude to my eco colleagues who have been fantastic as well, to the dynamic presenters we've had on today. I think this was mind blowing. The information provided is intense and I'm really happy that we are sharing the presentations, sharing the various uh, pieces of information that, that we've heard today. And those studies presented by Kuhn, those are wonderful. And I, I'm, I'm sure we'll be very happy to hear uh, more about those. Uh, just for me to quickly discuss the way forward, I think that uh, yeah, you've agreed that we will share the presentations that I think we need to do a little bit more work and collaboration to disseminate that information regarding the market study that Kuhn presented, at, as well as that related to transportation. Maybe we can have a session that goes more into depth discussing some of these issues, because I think it's of relevance to the various participants and the entrepreneurs. Uh, while it's going to be shared by a document, I think having a discussion on some of the issues and providing the opportunities that are in the document would be very useful. It is clear that food safety and access to trade information and market information is very relevant to our participants, so SMEs. And I believe we should find some way to develop some initiatives that can provide more tangible support. As Isolina said, we have a collaboration, we have a work plan, and we may need to share some of that information with you and explore interventions and can allow companies to scale up and access the opportunities that we hear in these markets in, in Europe. Uh, also, of course, climate change, adaptation, resilience, that is something that we need to focus on. I'm glad that Roderick brought that up. Uh, and I think that overall, we heard a lot of information from Christophe who talked about the food demand in Europe. 
and he says that they love the food from the Caribbean, from Guyana, Barbados, etc. And there's an opportunity bringing the sun to their supermarkets. And I think that is testimony, and it, it, it brings me to the the fact that we had Mrs. Zina Harvey, who was very dynamic, who was very instrumental in forging this alliance between ICA and Coal ACP and has really been a champion for agritourism and involving our culinary experts. And I think we need to build on that work that was done. And I think Mrs. Harvey is still on. Welcome Mrs. Harvey and thank you for your insights and input. And I think that we need to move forward addressing some of these um, opportunities in the culinary markets. So I, I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, in the interest of time. Let me stop right here and say that we'll be communicating with you all. And again, thank you to the participants for staying on so long. I know it's probably after six in Europe, in, in Africa, et cetera. And of course, to my colleagues in the, on the Caribbean side, uh, we welcome your participation and we wanna see you on board. We want your feedback. We want you to benefit from this experience. It should not just be a talk shop, but we wanna build your capacity to access markets and ultimately improve your livelihoods. So with that, let me thank you all again, Islina, your team, the ECA team, participants, colleagues. Thank you again. Have a fantastic weekend. Please stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you.